What you may not realize this morning is that Tracy and Lucinda Guppy were commissioned IMB missionaries to Nepal for eight years. And even though they came off of the mission field a few years ago, they realized that they really didn't come off the mission field. Tracy and Lucinda Guppy have continued to live on mission for Christ, and that's some of the fruit that we've been able to see from their ministry. So would you just take a, take a moment this morning and a, give a hand of encouragement uh, to Sadir and, of course, Tracy and Lucinda for your, your efforts. And love Sadir. We're back in shepherd land, everybody. We were at the shepherd last week looking in John 10 about Jesus making that divine claim that I am the good shepherd. And now we're still in John chapter 10, still dealing with another divine claim that Jesus inserts into our understanding of the shepherd. And it's a really beautiful picture. And the reason we're doing this series, the Jesus in his own words, is because many of us may have thoughts or opinions or beliefs about who Jesus is. We may have friends, family members, enemies that have beliefs or opinions or thoughts about who Jesus is. Those may be accurate. They may be inaccurate. But I think it's good for us to be able to go back and revisit who Jesus said he was in his own words. And in doing that, we're spending these weeks looking at the seven I am statements. I am is the divine claim It's the same name that God gave to Moses when Moses said, Whom shall I tell them has sent me? God said, I am that I am. Tell them I am has sent you. God chose I am as his divine name, speaking about his self-sufficiency, his eternal nature, his separation. He is who he is. And I want to remind you as we do every one of these messages in these series that it's a blessing to know that Jesus told us who he is. Because how else would we know who God is, who Christ is, were it not for the only begotten Son of God telling us? How would we know who he is were it not for the Word made flesh dwelling among us, telling us from his own lips who he is? We're grateful for how he told us who he is. He takes these great big pictures, this great big understanding of who he is, And he whittles it down to words like bread that we can understand. Words like a ray of light that we can comprehend. Words like a shepherd that even with a little distance, we still get the basic understanding of what a good shepherd does. And today we see a door. Thirdly, we're thankful why he told us. And it reveals to us that we have an inviting God who wants us to know him. Wants us to know him as he is. And his statements of who he is often cuts through the lies and the confusion about who we think he is and who sometimes we even make him out to be. And this morning he uses this word, door. Some of your translations may say gate, but I want you to think about this word door for just a moment in our introduction this morning. We all know doors. I mean, just like we know bread, just like we know light. Even though we may not know Good Shepherd as well, we understand the role of a shepherd. So here, Creator God uh, and His Son Jesus says, I want everybody to know who I am, and I'm going to liken myself to a door. Now think about for a moment, because door technology really hasn't changed all that much over 2,000 years. They still open and they close. But I want you to think, as we're kind of setting this up this morning, I want you to think about some of the applications of doors, and and more specifically, maybe the doors in your life. Think about this. The door represents opportunity. We often think of that. We talk about how God opens doors and closes others. We've even prayed. The Apostle Paul prayed for the door of the gospel to be open. So we see a door as an opportunity. I'm getting ready to enter in somewhere. We may also realize that doors represent newness. Some of you may remember, the men uh, that are married, you may remember when you were standing at the front of the church and, and you were all dressed up and the preacher was there and all your friends and family were there. And You may remember the moment that back door swung open and the music changed and everybody stood and in walked your bride through that door. You remember her walking through. You remember seeing her face. You remember what she was look like. All of that is a precious memory for you, I hope. And for that bride that was walking through that door, she knew that she was taking that stroll with her father, who would at the end of that aisle give her away to represent a new 
life. We also think of a door as an entrance and an exit. Some of you may remember not just walking in a door, but walking out of a door. And doors also represent change. Some of you may recall when you were at a hospital with a family member who passed. And you had to walk out of that hospital door. And you may remember walking out of that door. Maybe it was the door of their room. Maybe it was the door of the hospital. Maybe it was the door of the funeral home. You walked out of that door realizing that door represented significant change. For some of you, it's going to be walking through the door of your high school for the last time. Or soon coming, walking through the door of your college, your university for the last time. That door represents change. Doors also separate. If you think about it, this building has a lot of external doors, but we also have a lot of internal doors. You may not know this, but we have internal doors inside of internal doors. That's how serious it is around here. External, interior, and the innermost interior doors we have in this place. And those doors separate. The external doors separate you from the outside to the inside. And once you're inside, it separates rooms. You can't be in two rooms at the same time without passing through a door. And finally, doors include and exclude. And I think this morning when we look at what doors represent for us, though it's not an exhaustive list, we can probably all grab a hold to this idea of a door and an opportunity, newness, entrance, exit, change, separation, inclusion, and exclusion. And let me tell you, I believe every one of those pictures is found in Jesus. Opportunity, newness, entrance, exit, change, separate, inclusion, and exclusion. And this morning, Jesus makes the claim in verse 7 and verse 10 of chapter 10, saying, I am the door. What does entrance through this door provide for us? I want you to join me. Let's read verses t- chapter 10, verse 1 through 11 in John. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What can we expect when we walk through that door, when we enter into this sheepfold, as we studied last week, this flock of God, this family of sheep? What can we expect when we enter into that door? Because Jesus doesn't just tell us that He is the door. He lets us know what we can expect once we're on the inside. And the first one is really clear. It jumps off the page. Jesus says that the one who comes to me will be saved. If anyone comes, he will be saved. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. This word saved, ultimately, we understand what it would mean for a sheep, and we'll get to that in a moment in the second point. But I think what Jesus is illustrating here is not just the relationship of the shepherd to the sheep. And even though this is a picture in which all of John 10 is is, is painted around, Jesus is also dealing with people. He's not teaching us how to be good shepherds as much as he is showing us his relationship to the sheep or us as believers. So when he's saying that anyone who comes into me will be saved, when he says anyone, he's not talking about sheep now. He's talking about people. And he's saying that we will be saved. We will pass from death to life. We will be saved from the judgment and the penalty of our sin. We will be saved eternally. Four times in John 10, it kind of sneaks in on us, but four times in this teaching of the good shepherd, Jesus references a door. Four times. 
Once in verse 1, once in verse 2, once in verse 7, and once in verse 10. And Jesus is, is saying by this divine claim that I am the only door. He's making this claim of exclusivity. The same as he did with bread. The only way we're going to find real life and nourishment is going to be from him. He's making himself exclusive and making the claim that he is exclusive from every other person out there. He is different. He is divine. So when he paints that word bread, he's saying, if you're hungry, you've got to come to me. I'm the only way you're going to survive. I am the only true nourishment that is going to give you life. When Jesus made the claim that he is the light of the world, he made that claim, and in saying that, he's saying everything else is darkness that is not of me. When he made the claim that he is the good shepherd, he made that claim to say, I am the exclusive good shepherd. There is no other one. All the ones that came before me were thieves and robbers. And now he's making that same claim of exclusivity about the door. He's saying there is no other way to be saved but by me. That's what, by, by Jesus. That's what he's saying. If you were to take chapter 10, verse 7 and verse 10, and throw it in a pot and boil it, what you would get at the end when it's all rendered down is Jesus saying, I'm the only door, I'm the only way to be saved. The early church that turned the world upside down, those believers who had seen the resurrected Christ and put their lives on the line and went out advancing the kingdom of God over continents and, and countries and hillsides and, and saw people saved and the world turned upside down. Do you know what their message was? There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. They went out preaching that Jesus Christ is exclusively the only way to heaven. No other religion, no other relationship, no other ritual is able to get you into heaven except through a personal relationship with Jesus. And I know, I know that for many of you, you've heard this for years. I would say that some of you, maybe many of you in here would consider yourself Baptist. This is not a new truth to you. And even if you're not considering yourself a Baptist and you're a believer, you've probably heard this before, that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven exclusively. I think sometimes our familiarity with the truth can make us a little numb to its scope. We hear that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, and we rejoice. We're thankful that God has allowed us to be able to see the need of Jesus in our life as a sinner and that we had access to the gospel to be able to hear it. However, if I believe that truth, which I do, that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, yes, it is fair for me to rejoice in that truth. But shouldn't there also be some level of burden leveled against the believer as well? After that season of rejoicing and praise and thanksgiving is over, shouldn't we find ourselves burdened for those who have yet to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? For those who live in an area, a country, a region that is so enmeshed in a false religion being deceived? Shouldn't you and I be burdened for the ones that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ? The answer is yes. That truth brings about great joy to our heart, but it should also remind us that there is a world outside of us that is dying because they have not entered in through the only exclusive door, which is Jesus Christ. We should be, as people who are burdened by that truth, we should find ourselves praying for the lost. Praying for the lost in our own community, our own circles, our own social influences, Pray for those in other countries and people groups that have yet to hear the good news that Jesus says that if anyone comes through that door, they will be saved. We should not just pray, but we should also give to the work for the missionaries that are serving, like Tracy and Lucinda were, to give and participate through that way. But we should also consider going. We should consider putting ourselves aside to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in whatever capacity, whether that is being a missionary on our street, on Fur Road, 
whether that's being a missionary in your own community, your neighborhood, your state, your country, or the world. Jesus said these words towards the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. Verse 13 and 14, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Few go through that door. Many will not. It's not socially acceptable right now in our culture to say there's only one way to heaven. In a godless culture, we want to know that there are many ways to heaven. We want to think that that there are many different roads that ultimately lead there, whether it's another religion, whether it's another plan of salvation. It may not be anything about another religion that you've come in here thinking there's another way to heaven outside of Christ, but maybe you have thought that your works might be able to be enough to purchase your entrance into heaven. That's not true. There's no way at all for our works to be able to be enough to purchase our heaven. In fact, some go through their life with this idea that they are weighing their good deeds against their bad deeds. And when they die, this giant scale will appear and their good deeds will be, raised, will be weighed against their bad deeds. And they go through this life and even enter into eternal life without the assurance to know that it's not based off of our works. All of our works, Isaiah said, are as filthy rags. There is none righteous, no, not one. So it's not really nice. The culture doesn't like to hear that Jesus Christ is the only way. They don't like to hear that he is exclusively the only way to heaven because they want to know or want to believe that their own way to heaven is going to work. So even though they don't like hearing it, and even though maybe in your own heart you may feel a little uncomfortable with that idea that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, you may have a problem with the one way. But let me suggest this. If you come in here and you have a hard time wrapping your mind around the idea that God would only make one way to heaven through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, let me tell you something. It's incredible that God would make a way for us at all. If we start getting upset that there's only one way, remember who we were when we were lost. The Bible says that we were enemies of God, separated. There are none that seek him, no, not one. All of us are like sheep going astray, every man to his own way. The Bible says that we had the poison of vipers under our, li- under our tongue. The Bible does not picture us in our lost condition as being lovable, In fact, if you think about it, yes, there is one way to heaven and praise God for it because God in our unrighteousness didn't even have to make a way for us at all, but because of his love and his grace, he provided a way exclusively in his son, Jesus Christ. So if we get upset about it, remember, he didn't even have to do that. We weren't worthy of it. We weren't deserving of it. There were none of us crying out to God saying, God, please make a way. No, we were shaking our fists. We were enemies. We were set up against him. The offended party, God, is the one who initiated a way for the offending party to be right with him. That's incredible to me. So when you and I walk out of here, yes, we have an opportunity to say, God, thank you that I have entered into the gate. Thank you, God, that you have provided a way for me through my life to be able to hear the gospel, to be drawn by the Spirit, to believe in Christ as my Savior, and to rejoice that there is no other way, and to pray for those who have yet to hear, yet to encounter the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What can we expect when we walk through that door? We're saved. Or as Sadir said so eloquently, I am a sheep. What's the second thing that we can expect? Number two, security. Security. Notice what Jesus says in verse 7. Truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. 
I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Notice verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. When we're talking about security here, I want to make sure that there's a differentiation. Jesus is speaking about the eternal security of the believer. Later in chapter 10, verse 27, 28, and 29, Jesus says that those who have come through the door are placed in the hand of the Father, and no one is able to take them out of the Father's hand. No one. They are secure. In verses 7, 8, 9, and 10, Jesus says that entrance into the sheepfold provides you security from the thief and the robber. That's what Jesus says. He's saying that once you enter into that sheepfold, you are now no longer able to lose your salvation, your relationship, your position, your standing with God. He can try all he wants, but he cannot take you out of the Father's hand. He is speaking about the eternal security of the believer. Now remember, eternal security does not always equal physical safety. Two different things. Just because I am eternally secure in Christ does not mean I will not experience or I will get to bypass the hurts, the hardships, the disappointments, the diseases that come in this life. It does not mean that. Jesus is not saying once you become a Christian, these things are not going to be difficult. If anything, becoming a Christian is even more difficult for us at times. But the great news is, is that once we are in the sheepfold, we never go through it alone. God uses the hardships and the hurts and the disappointments and the diseases and the setbacks. He uses those for our good to train us and to remind us and to transform us, to turn us into the picture of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the security we have. And as a believer, you may know, though your flesh may fail, your soul is solid with God. There's a second thing that comes from security. Once I know that I am eternally secure in the sheepfold, I have confidence. Now, this is why I think this picture is so beautiful. I really do. This is why Jesus gives us two I am statements in the middle of his shepherd teaching. When Jesus says, I'm the door... We have a door in our mind, but the door that Jesus was speaking of in his time to that audience was different. I want to show you a picture of a sheepfold on the screen. I want you to see something about it. Austin, will you show the first one? This is a typical sheepfold. You'll see that there's a cave back in there providing a little shelter, and then you see that the one abundant thing they have in Israel are rocks, right? Right? So they've taken the rocks and they formed this wall up against this natural barrier right here. But you'll notice right here, there is no gate. There's no door. There's no hinges. There's nothing. Will you show us the second picture, Austin? This is another sheepfold, a little taller wall. This puts it into perspective about the others trying to climb over the wall. But you have this pretty secure wall. And again, you have this open gate. You have this open area. There's no gate, no hinges, no metalwork, no wood, no nothing. When Jesus was saying he was the door, he was speaking to people who understood exactly what he meant in the picture. What the shepherd would do is as he would call his sheep and they would follow him, he would lead them into this corral. And then once they were all in there, the shepherd would sit or lay in the doorway. That's what he would do. He literally became the door. What does that mean? That means that once those sheep are inside and the shepherd is laying at the only entrance, what they understood and what we need to remember is that anything that comes into my life has to pass through the shepherd. Everything. There's nothing going to come into my life as a member of the flock of God that does not have to be allowed entrance by the shepherd. And yes, it may hurt. 
Yes, it may be scary. Yes, it may be painful. But nothing in my life is able to come into my life without first having passed through the door of the shepherd. Why? Because Jesus makes that claim. This is not me making this up. This is Jesus in his own words. I am the door of the sheep. This is what he was talking about. So you and I that are up here in the fold with the other sheep, you and I who have entered into that relationship with Christ and become part of the family of God, we have that assurance. When I get the call from the doctor that the test results are not good, yes, I can be startled. Yes, I can be stunned, and yes, I could even be shaken. But there's going to be a time as a child of God, as a sheep of God, that I'm going to know and steady myself with the truth that that did not come into my life without the shepherd's approval. There are going to be times I'm disappointed. There are going to be times I'm hurt. There are going to be times I am incredibly tempted And you're going to say, God, why in the world? What's going on? Do you not love me anymore? Do you not care about me anymore? Church, have confidence in the security of yourself in the sheepfold in this picture that nothing has walked into your life that has not been allowed by the door of your life. Jesus Christ. It's not just security. It's confidence. And there are those of us that need that at varying times, sometimes more. We're shaken and we're staggering and we're stumbling and we're scared. But to steady ourselves with that truth. That God, you are the shepherd and Jesus has allowed this in my life. So what does that bring? If I have security and confidence to approach every season of life, as allowed by God. You know what this gives me? It gives me incredible freedom. Freedom. To not be taken with fear. To not be robbed of joy. But to be able to behold everything I'm going through as having passed through the Master's hands. To know that He is with me in the midst of it. And He cares about me and He loves me because He's the Good Shepherd. You say freedom. You say, Pastor, isn't Christianity restrictive? (laughs) I mean, really, aren't the Ten Commandments, don't they all start out with thou shalt not? Pastor, what are you talking about freedom? Let me ask you a question. What is absolute freedom to a sheep? What does that mean for a sheep? Absolute freedom. I'll tell you what it means. It means death. Absolute freedom for a sheep is a death sentence. You know why? That sheep has nobody to disentangle it when its wool gets caught in the thorns and the briars. The sheep has nobody to defend it from the wolves and the predators. Because that sheep has nobody to lead it to the good grass and the fresh water. That sheep that's out there absolutely free with not living under the reign of the shepherd, that sheep has an opportunity to die in some of the most horrible manners possible. That sheep would not have someone to doctor its wounds and heal it. It wouldn't have someone to seek it in its endangered and vulnerable state. It would not ensure that there's plentiful, healthy grass and fresh water. It would not have any of those things. Absolute freedom to a sheep would literally be a death sentence. So we come in here and we say, you're saying there's freedom, pastor? Isn't it restrictive? I would say, aren't stoplights restrictive? They're annoying, aren't they? The lines on the road? Come on. Speed limit signs? I'm preaching at people now. Yes. Lines on roads are restrictive. Stoplights are restrictive. Stop signs are restrictive. Speed limit signs are restrictive. 
But what would our world look like if there weren't any of those restrictions there? Truth be told, even with all of our fancy lane assist and stopping, we still stink at driving. I don't even want to think of what the world would be like, me sending my 16-year-old son out to drive on a road that had no lights, no lanes, no signs. Friends, the signs are there for our good, and we know it. When we stop to that stoplight, yes, we hate it that we're giving up 30 seconds of our life or five minutes if you're on range line. We hate it that we're giving up that time, but you know what? The core of us, we're grateful that everybody's abiding by those rules too. We're thankful that they're there because they keep us safe. What if, what if, what if the restrictions that God has given to us as followers of Christ are for our good? What if the author of life, he who alone knows all things, he knows this world better than anybody else, he knows the enemy better than anybody else, and he knows our propensity to go crazy. What if in his infinite wisdom he gave restrictions for our good? He did. Yes, there are restrictions but they're for my good because the shepherd knows me. The shepherd knows my enemy. The shepherd knows the world I live in, and he's doing it for my good. I don't want to think of what it would look like for a sheep to be all on its own. No wonder. <laughs> no wonder. In Luke 15... Jesus tells us that the shepherd leaves the ninety and nine and runs after the one that has gone astray. You know why he ran? Because the sheep was on its own, vulnerable, endangered, and needed a shepherd. Saved, secure, and number three, satisfied. Anyone comes through the door, he will go in and out and find pasture. Pasture, friends, is the greatest good a sheep could have. It represents food. It represents life. It represents relaxation. It represents a lack of stress, not having to worry about where the next meal comes from. And let me tell you this, and I hope this cuts through all the lies that the enemy is implanting in our minds and in our hearts. True satisfaction is only found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. The deepest, truest satisfaction you can ever have in life is only found through a personal faith relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know what's really hard for me as a pastor? I want to tell you all of the ways Jesus satisfies, but I can't. I can tell you that Jesus saves, and I can go to Scripture and point it out. I can tell you that you are secure in Christ, and I can go to Scriptures and point that out. But when it comes to satisfaction, I can only tell you what other satisfied people have said. Satisfaction is something you experience for yourselves personally. And what did Jesus say? He said, I am the door. He did not say, I'm a hallway that you have to walk down. He did not say, I'm a long tunnel that you have to navigate your way through. He did not say, I'm at a line and there are a lot of people in front of you and you have to wait your turn. He didn't say, I'm an obstacle course, so you have to accomplish these things in order to get to me. No, he said, I'm a door. I'm present. He's right here, right now, one faith step away for saving, for securing for all eternity, and satisfied to the core of who you are through that relationship. No wonder the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. Don't just take my word for it. 
Don't just take Jesus' word for it, I guess, in this sense. Experience it for yourself. Always take Jesus' word for it. But experience it yourself. Some of you may have heard about the door. Some of you may have seen the door. Some of you are incredibly close to the door. Some of you have seen others go through the door like Sadir. Some of you may even believe that Jesus is the door, but have never taken that one faith step through the door. Can I tell you something? You have to take that step yourself. Nobody can push you through that door. Nobody. And church, nobody can pull you through from the other side. As much as we want to. Oh, as much as we in that sheepfold, knowing the salvation we have, knowing the security we have, knowing the satisfaction we have, our arms want to reach out to those who are outside and pull them in, but we can't. We all have a list, friends and family. We want nothing more than to be in that sheepfold, saved, secured, and satisfied, but I can't pull them in because it has to be that person's faith step to say, Lord Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner that I am separated from you. And I acknowledge my sinful self. And Lord Jesus, I believe that you lived the perfect life and met God's standard of complete and perfect holiness. And I believe that you died on the cross. Make no mistake, Jesus is the door and it swings on the hinges of the cross and the resurrection. And you died, and three days later, after you were buried, you were raised again to new life. And today, this moment, right here, right now, not a long tunnel, not down the road somewhere, not another time, right now, Jesus stands as the door, newness, opportunity. That's Jesus Christ. All of those pictures, an entrance, a change, a separation, inclusion. Jesus Christ is the door. It doesn't matter how much you know about the door. It doesn't matter how much you've seen the door, how close you are to the door, if you never take that step. Eric Martin was in the first service this morning. When we went to the invitation, he came forward and he said, I know you were talking to me and you're waiting on me. And I listened to Eric as he talked during the invitation time as we were counseling. And he said, Pastor, I was saved when I was 13, and today I come to rededicate my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He had gone through that door at age 13, but he fell for those stupid enticements of the world. He fell for the tricks and the blinding, blinding attributes of the world. And friends, I promise you, the satisfaction you find in Jesus is something that the world does not know and can only try to imitate. It can never, never duplicate what only comes from Christ. And as much as I want to, I can't pull you through. Your family can't pull you through. Your friends can't pull you through. We can pray, but it has to be your decision. Anyone, doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter who you are, Jesus, the door will open to all who come by faith. There is no other way. What is your decision today? Have you ever walked and taken that faith step to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you trusted in your works? Have you trusted in your rituals? Have you trusted in your religion to get you there? It will not work. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting, and few there be that find it. Today, the door's been presented. The door stands ready. Will you take that faith step? If you take that faith step this morning, I'm going to ask you if you would just take that faith step out of your seat and come forward. 
share with our counselors, today I'm taking my faith step to trust Christ as my Lord and Savior. We want to rejoice with you. We want to welcome you into the fold, into the family of God. We want to celebrate with the angels of God in heaven. Maybe you're here and you've trusted Christ and you've fallen for the entrapments of the world. You realize the danger of what it is to be a wandering sheep. And today you return to the fold, not being saved again, but recommitting your life like Eric to the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray this morning, whatever that decision is. Maybe you've been saved but have never been baptized. And this morning you say, I need to take that first step of obedience to Jesus Christ. Father, this morning, help us remember the beauty of that door. For those believers that are here, that we would not be shaken no matter what the diagnosis is, no matter what the disaster is that we're facing. Father, to know that you still stand guard, you still love us, you care for us, even greater than a shepherd does the sheep. We have immense value to you, God. You've never left us or abandoned us. So I pray that you would provide strength and courage for your people. And for those, Lord, that are teetering right now on that decision, I pray that they would not go one more moment without responding to the Spirit's work and drawing them through that door. Father, help us today to leave here rejoicing that you are the door. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us for service this morning. If you made any decisions or would like to talk to someone, please contact the church office. We look forward to meeting you in person.